My name is Bruce McConnell. I'm a distinguished fellow at the Observer Research Foundation America. Welcome everyone to our global cyber policy dialogue, the first one that we are conducting here uh, in Latin America. Um, we have good representation today from across Latin America, including uh, representatives of governments, civil society, academia, private sector, and multilateral and international organizations. Um, interpretation is available in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. Please use the button at the bottom of your screen to select a channel. So I wanna start by uh, thanking our partners who, for our, the support making this event happen today, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Chile, and we are uh, honored to uh, be hearing shortly from Ambassador Gloria Navarrete. Um, also our co-partner, the Ministry of, and sponsor, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands, and uh, representing them today, Ambassador Natalie Yarsma, the Ambassador at Large for Security Policy and Cyber, and Ambassador Carmen Gonsalves, who is the Ambassador at the Embassy of the Netherlands in Chile. Uh, and finally, our partner uh, on the civil society side, the Center for Information Technology Law Studies and its uh, director, Daniel Alvarez. Um, we have a good agenda today and uh, quite, uh, quite uh, packed. We will, there we go. Um, so we, you will hear in a minute from our opening uh, speakers. Uh, Ambassador Navarrete um, is the Secretary General for Foreign Policy. Uh, the highest uh, career uh, foreign service position in the ministry. And before that, as we were discussing earlier, she served in uh, Vienna. So she has, uh, uh, with being a representative for all the various international organizations there, uh, she has a lot of experience in this multilateral uh, international world. Uh, ambassador Yarsma is the ambassador at large for security policy and cyber uh, uh, in uh, The Hague. And uh, before that, she served as uh, ambassador in Nicosia and uh, has a, a distinguished career uh, in uh, foreign service and also uh, in business prior to that. Um, after the uh, opening remarks, we will move on to a uh, panel discussion. I will introduce the panelists uh, at the time, but uh, this gives me an opportunity to say uh, just a little bit about the topics uh, that we're going to be considering today. So as you uh, may uh, have noted in the uh, materials, we're covering three things. We're talking about the normative framework for cyber stability and uh, basically how uh, the United Nations is working uh, to create rules of the road so that uh, states in particular use uh, cyber tools and cyber uh, weapons uh, in a manner that is uh, safe and, uh, and complies with international law. So those rules of the road efforts uh, have now expanded. And the second topic that we are uh, going to be discussing uh, is cybercrime in particular and cybercrime uh, cooperation, uh, and especially on a, on a regional level uh, and uh, improving the ability to uh, exchange uh, evidence and cooperate on investigations uh, in the cyber uh, space, uh, since cyber is almost always an international crime. And uh, finally, uh, we will also be talking about the relationship between the digital uh, transformation that all countries are undergoing and how it interacts with cybersecurity, cyber stability, and, and economic development. So uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of meaty topics, and we'll come back to those uh, in uh, much more detail during the panel discussion. Um, at the end, uh, our partner, uh, Daniel Alvarez, will make some observations about what he's been listening to and any other thoughts uh, that he has. So uh, that's, uh, I'm looking forward to having a great uh, conversation today. And um, without uh, further ado, uh, let me uh, turn the floor over to, here we have some housekeeping notes. Uh, so we've talked about interpretation. We will send you a link uh, for the video. If you have questions for the panelists, uh, please use the Q and A function. Uh, and you can also, uh, if you have uh, studies or other resources that you think uh, would be relevant to share with people, uh, feel free to use those in the, um, uh, use the chat, chat box for that. 
sometimes in these conversations, we have quite uh, interesting conversations going on in the chat box. Uh, this meeting is the uh, is a pre-meeting in some ways for an in-person meeting that we expect to uh, host uh, in Santiago um, uh, in the future, maybe this year, maybe early next year, uh, or travel situation permitting. But without uh, further ado, let me introduce our first speaker, uh, Ambassador Gloria Navarrete. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Mr. McConnell. Ambassador of the Kingdom of the Netherlands in Chile, Her Excellency Mrs. Carmen Gonzalez, Ambassador at Large, Security and Cyber Policy of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, Her Excellency Mrs. Natalie Yarsma, Member of the Observer Research Foundation America, Mr. Bruce McConnell, distinguished panelists and participants. I would like to begin by expressing my sincere thanks to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Kingdom of the Netherlands and the Observer Research Foundation America for this initiative that seeks to develop a dialogue on cybersecurity policies from a Latin American perspective. I would also like to thank the Centro de Estudios en Derecho Informático, CEDI, of the University of Chile for its collaboration in the development of this meeting. Currently, thousands of cyber attacks and malicious incidents occur every day, many of which affect or may affect our critical infrastructure and jeopardize the well being and development of countries. Cyber attacks are a real threat to the international security and countries have a responsibility to reach agreements to establish a secure information and communications technology environment. In this sense, understanding the risks and threats in cyberspace in terms of the commission of crimes and aware of the need for the cooperation in the fight against cybercrime, which demands the commitment of the states to act quickly and effectively, is that Chile in 2017 adhered and enacted in its domestic legislation the Convention on Cybercrime of the Council of Europe or Budapest Convention, thus becoming the first country in South America to do so. With our access to the Convention, this reflects our country's firm multilateral commitment to cybersecurity. Chile uh, became part of a fast and effective system of international cooperation, which has also allowed us to receive assistance for the development of our national capabilities to better face threats in cyberspace. The importance of the Budapest Convention, whose 20th anniversary we commemorated in November 2021, lies in the fact that it is the only binding international instrument on the subject, which has become a guide for the development of comprehensive national legislation in countries to combat cybercrime. On the other hand, Chile has strongly supported the work of the United Nations expert groups and understands that the recommendations of these groups contribute to providing a solid basis on which countries can act and work to achieve an open, secure, stable, accessible, and peaceful cyberspace. From our region, we have made efforts to advance in the establishment of measures to promote cooperation and trust in cyberspace within the framework of the working group of the Organization of American States established in 2017 for the development of such measures. As a country, we are convinced that from our region, we can make an important contribution in this area. For example, in the open-ended working group on the developments of in the field of information and telecommunication in the context of international security, which held its first meeting last December and in the process to develop a new convention on cybercrime. In this sense, this dialogue is an excellent opportunity to exchange views 
and reflect on these processes as well as to analyze the main challenges our region faces in terms of cybersecurity, cybercrime, and digital transformation. The work of regional organizations is key to achieving greater security in cyberspace. In this regard, I would like to highlight the work of the cybersecurity program of the Inter-American Committee Against Terrorism of the OAS, which has made it possible to specialize government representatives in issues that are part of the United Nations cybersecurity agenda. Regarding the challenges that we face as a region, although it is true that many of our countries began to implement some initiatives to develop cybersecurity capabilities since 2016, we certainly still have a long way to go. For example, the design and implementation of national cybersecurity strategies the promotion of discussion in international processes and the promotion of regional cooperation measures, just to mention a few. Considering these challenges, I believe that this event is an excellent opportunity to make progress on them as it allows us to discuss and evaluate the level of development we are at as a region and also provides us with a space to share good practices that will benefit us all. For Chile, these initiatives are very important. They must be inclusive and transparent. We firmly believe that the discussion on information and communication technologies, the private sector, the academia, the civil society, the industry, the technical community should be included. Likewise, we consider relevant the incorporation of gender considerations in such processes. It is not possible to build a stable and secure environment in cyberspace if we do not guarantee the participation and work of all stakeholders. Certainly, the more stakeholders are involved in the discussion, the more possibilities we have of achieving results that are beneficial to all. In this regard, I take this opportunity to highlight the work that University of Chile has been developing, particularly the Center for Studies in Computer Law, CEDI, which contributed from the academy, from a scientific and multidisciplinary perspective with research in the field of the relationship between law and new technologies, as well as with proposals to develop legislative changes that allow for better regulation of new technologies. This type of instance that we are developing right now are a very interesting forum to discuss the challenges that we face as a region in the area of cybersecurity, as well as to learn about good practices and move forward towards greater cooperation on this sensitive issue. We hope this dialogue will be a contribution in this process. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Those are a great uh, way to kick things off. Uh, and we are so grateful for your hosting us here in Santiago uh, today. All right, let me turn now to Ambassador Yarsma. Uh, the floor is yours, Natalie. Thank you, Bruce. Um, dear participants, um, thank you for joining. And thank you to uh, Ambassador Navarrete for her insightful uh, opening remarks. It gives me great pleasure to be part of this exciting and thought-provoking roundtable on digital transformation, the normative framework for cyberspace and international cooperation against cybercrime. I'm especially pleased to see that uh, diverse, this diverse range of uh, participants from the multi-stakeholder community, because keeping cyberspace open, free and secure is our collective endeavor. The Netherlands became a leading digital nation through the adoption of digital technologies early on. In recent years, the digital economy contributed over 8% to the total Dutch economy. The open nature of our economy and strong internet infrastructure have been conducive to innovation and research. Yet access to cyberspace is not evenly spread globally and locally both in the Netherlands and Latin America. We have learned that cyberspace 
in itself is not necessarily a force for good. It requires carefully balanced interventions by all stakeholders to avoid replicating societal, economic and political inequalities. Bridging the digital divide is a fundamental step to safeguard the social and economic benefits of digital transformation. We want to enable people, young people and women in particular, to participate in the digital economy, to create the digital world in line with their values and priorities. While we engage in efforts to bridge the digital divide, there are two important elements to consider. Both elements revolve around trust. Firstly, our citizens, companies and organizations need to be able to trust the security of digital solutions they use in their everyday life. They must know that their personal data are not being stolen, misused or accumulated in an unlawful manner. They must also know that the general availability and integrity of the internet will not be disrupted. The so-called public core of the internet has been managed by the multi-stakeholder community. Any interference with the public core is considered irresponsible behavior and would undermine security and trust. This is roughly, roughly the technical side of trust. Secondly, citizens and companies, but also governments, need to trust each other to build a flourishing, interoperable and equitable digital economy. Trust is obviously not a given. Every day our countries suffer from malicious cyber operations by state and non-state actors, which have real life consequences. We would call this the human side of trust. Of course, these elements are two sides of the same coin. At the end of the day, the technical and human sides of trust are codependent and must reinforce each other. By extension, the technical community should be involved in and aware of policy processes and vice versa. In the remainder of my remarks, I will highlight three principles that contribute to building trust in cyberspace. Inclusivity, responsibility and sustainability. For each of these principles, I give examples of concrete actions. First, inclusivity. For any agreed international framework to be implemented effectively, it has to be grounded in an inclusive process. It was very encouraging to see the entire UN membership reaffirm by consensus the framework for responsible state behavior in the open-ended working group in 2021. Similarly, the Netherlands is convinced that all voices should be heard in the negotiations of a UN convention on cybercrime, whether large or small, without unilaterally imposing ready-made proposals. Inclusivity also means that all stakeholders cooperate effectively. The strong involvement of the private sector in cyberspace and the expertise of academia and civil society cannot be overstated. In that respect, the Netherlands is pleased to see a strong multi-stakeholder component in the UN Ad Hoc Committee on Cybercrime and hopes that this will enrich the outcomes of these intergovernmental negotiations. Inclusivity is closely related to ownership. When we engage in capacity building efforts, the Netherlands has been a vocal proponent of local communities taking ownership. The Global Forum on Cyber Expertise, or GFCE, based in the Netherlands, is a leading example of a public-private cyber capacity building platform that brings together local needs, resources, and expertise. The GFCE and the OAS are currently preparing for the establishment of a GFCE hub in the Latin American region, a project that our distingu distinguished panelist of today, Kerry Ann Barrett, is closely involved with. We would also invite all those present today to join the GFCE. Secondly, responsibility. International trust in cyberspace can only be attained when states are guided in their actions by international law and the normative framework for responsible state behavior in cyberspace. When states do behave irresponsibly, 
the international community should be able to address those actions through diplomatic means. Moreover, governments should take responsibility for actions and policies in their own local context. By strengthening digital resilience of citizens and companies, by developing dedicated computer emergency response teams, by enabling the responsible disclosure of ICT vulnerabilities, and by setting up and training specialized cybercrime units in law enforcement, to name a few. Businesses, civil society, academia, and governments alike have a responsibility for the impact of the use of digital technologies on human rights and fundamental freedoms. Cybersecurity and human rights are mutually reinforcing and interdependent. So we believe human rights should be at the center of policy and legislation at all levels, including on cybercrime and digitalization. Thirdly, sustainability. A stable and accessible digital environment is essential to achieving the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The use of digital technologies can either accelerate or undermine progress towards the SDGs. It is with good reason that the UN Secretary General has characterized connectivity as SDG zero. Lastly, results and agreements cannot be sustainable when they are not properly implemented. If we do not cooperate internationally to implement agreements, they risk becoming empty shells. Therefore, the Netherlands is among a broad group of co-sponsors of a UN program of action to advance responsible behavior in cyberspace. We believe this program of action can facilitate concrete capacity building and exchange of best practices in order to enable states to implement the consensus normative framework endorsed, endorsed by the UN General Assembly in 2021. The program of actions focus on practical cooperation would be complementary to the open-ended working group, which can develop further agreements on the basis of consensus. We look forward to hearing your views on this program of action and how it can be most useful and effective. Before giving the floor back to our moderator, Bruce McConnell, let me underline that this very round table we participate in today also contributes to these three principles of inclusivity, responsibility, and sustainability in cyberspace. Therefore, I would like to thank our co-hosts, Chile and ORF America, and the Centro de Estudios en Derecho Informático for their good cooperation and excellent guidance. I wish the panelists an insightful discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to both our distinguished ambassadors for these opening remarks and uh, reminding us of important principles such as inclusivity, responsibility, and sustainability. And as, as you uh, noted, uh, we have a very inclusive group here uh, today. So uh, there's now 140 people uh, in, the, uh, in the room. So we, we welcome all, everyone who's joined us uh, along the way here. All righty, well, we are now going to turn to our uh, panel discussion. And uh, the structure of this is pretty open. The, uh, basically, uh, each of the panelists will make uh, very brief uh, opening statements. I'll explain a little bit about that, and then we'll get into a general discussion. If you have uh, questions for the, uh, any of them or for any of us, uh, please uh, use the Q&A function uh, for that. Um, and um, we'll, we will uh, do this until for about, uh, looks like we have about 50 minutes for our uh, discussion and uh, conversation. So uh, the speakers are uh, going to go in the order listed on the agenda, uh, beginning uh, with Carrie Ann Barrett, who is the Cybersecurity Policy Specialist at the uh, Inter-American Committee Against Terrorism as part of the Organization of American States, OIS, OAA. Uh, she will be, she's going to talk uh, about the uh, sort of at the broadest picture about uh, activities that are going on uh, both at the UN as well as in the region. She will be followed by uh, Claudio Peguero Castillo, who is uh, coming to us today as the vice chair of the United Nations Ad Hoc Committee on Cybercrime, which is a group that's just being uh, stood up really to, in, uh, for action. And uh, his uh, day job, if you will, 
is uh, as the uh, Inspector General and Advisor on uh, Cyber Matters uh, at the uh, National Police of uh, the Dominican Republic. Uh, we'll be, he will be followed by Barbara Machiori de Assis, who is uh, an uh, excellent expert on uh, cyber strategies, national cyber strategies, and uh, basically all things cyber. Uh, she is uh, wearing currently her hat as the uh, as a lecturer uh, in international program on cybersecurity and privacy management uh, at Isan University, and she will be followed by Luis Fernando Garcia, the executive director of the Red and Defensa de los uh, Derechos Digitales, a Mexican civil society organization, who will discuss uh, the uh, challenges of balancing. Uh, human rights and civil liberties uh, with the important uh, mission of uh, solving an, uh, uh, cyber crime and some other security issues in, uh, in cyberspace. So um, we're looking forward to a very practical discussion, one that will uh, presumably help, uh, help uh, the diplomats in New York uh, deal with the program of action and make it uh, actionable uh, and uh, not merely uh, theoretical. And so with that point, uh, Carrie Ann, the, the uh, floor is yours for your opening remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bruce. And I'll try to make the open remarks as brief as you said. Um, first, I think I'd like to start off by thanking the governments of Chile and the Netherlands um, for facilitating this and the ORF for actually inviting us to participate. Um, I think speaking more broadly um, and what the OES has to do with cybercrime and cybersecurity in the region in the context of what it's doing to support a free, open, secure cyberspace. Um, one of the things we wanted to emphasize is that from the OAS's perspective, we've always explained that the understanding of the terminology of what is cybercrime or understanding the core principles of criminal law always requires clarity and certainty in definitions of what is a criminal act. And how does this really relate to establishing criminal behavior and activity, especially in the borderless nature cyberspace. Um, another thing from a more broad perspective that we tend to ask you to think about before I get into specifics is the capacity needed to investigate and cooperate um, for the preservation of evidence is always critical in this digital age. Therefore, we think that capacity building program, for example, what we have at the OAS is designed to help our member states better combat cyber threats and indirectly it would meet its obligations under the 2015 and 2021 um, UNGGE norms. So if you think about it from that broad perspective of capacity building in order to even um, participate or be able to think about the UNGGE and the norms that are being developed, um, through our efforts we also recognize that there is no prescriptive way to do this. All of our member states throughout the region, if you look at the OAS IDB 2020 report as an example, you would see that um, through our application of the Oxford CMM, which is the cyber security maturity model, there are so many variations in terms of levels of maturity, capacity, ability to be able to develop legislations. So for us, there's no one size fits all or specific prescriptive methodology. And we tend to often advise our member states to think about dedicated investments and resources in a timely manner. And a good start, as an example, is developing incident response plans, enacting and implementing policy or normative frameworks, legislation, strategies, another term, um, raising awareness and enabling structures for cooperation with public private partners and academia and civil society also designating a national point of contact. So I think um, I jumped right in to give this broad perspective because we believe that national approaches to tackling cyber crime will differentiate depending on how cyber dependent the country is. And it will also be differentiated whether or not the crime is a cyber dependent crime or a cyber enabled crime. And we think about it from the perspective of what was the target and do you have the skill sets to actually identify that target or even the person who did it. Um, a lot of the member states as well think about um, cyber crime more broadly based on the traditional crimes that they would have. For example, 
online child exploitation would always fall under some form of child pornography. Identity theft, online financial scams, content related offenses, any particular crime with an ICT dimensions. Some of our member states in the region have very specific cyber crime or computer misuse legislation that could address this. And others rely on more broad legislations that they have in their criminal code. Now, if I'm supposed to just, I think I wanted to take the opportunity, um, Bruce, to also just give from that broad um, explanation what the OAS specifically, how we approach it and how the region can think about um, what they can access from the OAS as well. Um, the OAS uses two different vehicles to address cybercrime. First, as Ambassador um, Yarisma had mentioned earlier, there is SICTE, and Navarrete also mentioned the cybersecurity program. And for the cybersecurity program, we think about cybersecurity in the context of what can we do to operationalize the skill sets needed to address both cybersecurity and cybercrime matters under the general secretariat of the OAS. As such, we've developed various programs that assist our member states to address the challenges in a multifaceted way by encouraging multi-stakeholder involvement. And we also respond to our member states by helping them to address very specific capacities needed to establish their incident response teams. And the OAS also provides what's called the CSERT Americas Network, which actually provides timely 24-hour threat information to our member states. Um, we also look at the importance of establishing national cybersecurity strategies, which we think goes towards not only having a all of nation approach to be able to systematically address cyber threats, but it also thinks about promoting the culture and awareness needed for cybersecurity, because no matter how secure an institution or an entity is, it's always sometimes just an individual who's already on the inside of the firewall that does something that would cause jeopardy to the institution. Um, overall, from the SICTA perspective, cybercrime might seem like a very small component given that we look at cybersecurity more broadly, but the OAS on the other hand also has since 1997, um, the extraordinary meetings of the ministers of justice of the Americas known in Spanish as REMHA. And under this, the Department of Legal Cooperation acts as a secretariat, and there is a cybercrime working group that sits there. The cybercrime working group, if you think about what's even happening now at the negotiation level with the UN, this group gives advice on our, to our member states on how to investigate and prosecute cybercrime more specifically. There's a director of national points of contacts under that group. And they issue from time to time cybercrime questionnaires and training specific to combating cybercrime. Now, how does this all fit in um, to our discussion is that the OAS therefore participates, for example, in the Council of Europe TCY working group. We do participate as an observer to the UN group related to the open-ended working group process now and the UN GGE. And through all of our efforts, we have been encouraging, and this is a point I'll probably close on, the region to work towards thinking about international cybercrime standards and conventions, such as the Budapest Convention, which exists now, thinking about their skill sets more specifically related to techniques for international cooperation in the fight against cybercrime. And lastly, our main focus has been equipping our member states to be able to develop very effective cybercrime legislation. So I think I'll close on that because I know you just wanted us to kind of open up a more broad discussion on all the issues. So I'll hand over to hand back over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carrie Ann. That was a great introduction and reminding us all that, uh, as you say, uh, most most crimes, most cyber crimes are also regular crimes. But of course, uh, what's different about them is uh, the, the questions uh, not only of how law applies in cyberspace, which varies, uh, but also jurisdictional uh, challenges uh, and uh, problems of attribution and the volatility of evidence and, and different laws uh, regarding the release of evidence and, and uh, cooperating. And so to address some of those topics, um, we now have uh, Claudio Peguero, uh, who I believe has a couple of uh, slides uh, to give us some background about uh, this new group, the UN Ad Hoc Committee on Cybercrime. The floor is yours, uh, uh, General. Thank you, Bruce, and uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon for the, uh, those on the other side of the world. Uh, to everyone, 
Um, I also like to uh, join Carrie Ann in thanking the governments of uh, Chile and the Netherlands for organizing this and, and also the, the ORF. Um, I will try uh, to um, briefly describe what's going on uh, with uh, this uh, UN processes because uh, it's uh, you know, not, not just only one. Um, basically, we have uh, in, in parallel uh, a cyber security and a cyber crime uh, process and, and within those, uh, those two areas there's, there's been also uh, in one case, a parallel processes, and and, and the other one, uh, uh, two separate uh, processes that uh, somehow ended up uh, connecting themselves. So, uh, on the cybersecurity side, uh, we had um, uh, it's been actually uh, happening uh, since, but uh, lately, uh, then we have this uh, GGE, this group of governmental experts which was established uh, by uh, in the 73rd session uh, by resolution 266 uh, of the uh, General Assembly uh, with only 25 uh, selected member states. And then on that same uh, session, uh, the open-ended working group was established uh, and, and with the, the idea of to be, uh, you know, more inclusive and, and you know, being open uh, for every, uh, any state interested. Uh, to participate in. Uh, so this uh, GGE held uh, six uh, sessions. Uh, and, uh, and, and Claudio, we seem to have lost you here. Uh, started okay. Thank you. Um, from uh, 21, uh, 2021 to 2025. Uh, so on the cybercrime side, then uh, in the 12th uh, Congress on Crime Prevention and, and Criminal Justice in Salvador de Bahia in 2010, uh, it was decided that uh, some action was needed uh, for cybercrime. So it was uh, the first intergovernmental expert group uh, was established uh, to conduct a comprehensive study of the problem of, of cybercrime. Um, I was um, able to, to join this group by the third session uh, in 2017. And uh, you know, we spent all those uh, seven sessions discussing uh, what uh, options that we had, uh, and I, like Carrie Ann mentioned, uh, studied uh, the potential use of existing instruments like uh, the Budapest Convention. Uh, but uh, at the end, uh, we couldn't reach consensus on that, and uh, it was by by a, a group of uh, states uh, proposed to the uh, General Assembly uh, that uh, it, it was needed. Uh, to um, draft a new convention, a universal convention on cybercrime. So it was decided by the uh, General Assembly on the 74th session in 2019 to establish this open-ended ad hoc intergovernmental committee to elaborate this uh, new uh, convention. Um, so this um, ad hoc committee had its organizational session in May of last year, it was supposed to be January, but due to, to the COVID uh, situation uh, had to be postponed and the first substantive session uh, is supposed to happen in New York next week uh, beginning next Monday but as even as we speak uh, they're still um, arguing whether uh, this meeting is going to take place uh, next week in New York due to again to the COVID situation uh, there's been a, a a peak in the situation, half of the UN staff uh, is uh, affected with, with COVID and, and they pretty much suspended all in-person uh, meetings and, and so on, uh, or most of them. Uh, so uh, they're still deciding whether that's, uh, it's gonna happen next week in New York, it's gonna be moved to Vienna, it's gonna be done online, it's gonna be postponed. So we don't know yet, uh, but um, we uh, decided on having uh, six uh, substantive sessions uh, to uh, draft this. Uh, um, I think uh, this uh, may be uh, a little uh, little time to really achieve that. I think it's ambitious, uh, but the idea is to be able to have a, a draft, final draft by uh, 2024, uh, so that uh, it is um, then negotiated and, and open for, for signature. So, <clears throat> um, to ensure this uh, diversity on the on this group, 
uh, we have a, a quite large uh, bureau. Um, it was decided that each of the five uh, groups uh, you know, of the UN uh, would have uh, three representatives on this bureau. So uh, we ended up with one chair, one rapporteur and 13 vice chairs. Um, Dominican Republic uh, is part of the GRULAC, uh, the Latin American Caribbean group. And uh, I am one of the vice chairs for, for uh, this group, uh, also Nicaragua. Suriname was elected, uh, but Ambassador Sweep uh, left uh, her position. So now that uh, vice chair is vacant and uh, we're supposed to elect the new vice chair uh, on the first day of the next session, uh, which was supposed to be on Monday. Um, I think this, uh, at the end of the day, and I'll just uh, skip the rest of this, uh, to focus on, on this point. Um, I think um, somebody mentioned in the introduction uh, about uh, diplomats in New York. And I think uh, the, the key uh, thing to take into account about this specific process, about this specific convention, is that we need to realize that this is not about uh, cyber diplomacy. This is not about politics. This is about criminal justice. Uh, and, and we really need to focus on, on that, that we need uh, solutions uh, for the victims. We need solutions to reduce uh, impunity of crime and to be able to effectively uh, cooperate to solve those crimes. Uh, so I'll leave it at this and, and maybe then uh, along the discussion, touch upon other things. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And, and I think everyone uh, recognizes the importance of these, uh, these diplomatic and, and more theoretical discussions. We all operate within a context of, uh, of law and regulation and, and uh, politics and diplomacy. But uh, you know, the, the challenge has always been, uh, especially in international uh, cybercrime fighting, is, is uh, getting the cooperation to really work on a practical level considering all the uh, laws and, and regulations. So I, I, uh, I think we all wish you the best in your efforts and uh, in this, and we look forward to discussing it further. All right, uh, Barbara Marchiori, uh, tell us what your thoughts are on the, what you've been hearing and, and also on the topics uh, that we are considering here today. Gracias, Bruce. Eh, le voy a cambiar un poco el I'm going to change the topic more on transformation, digital transformation, digital transformation. It's focused on security in the international context. And I believe that if we talk about digital transformation and how the representatives of Netherlands commented, the issue of responsibility is very important as well. And I'm the private sector is also important in this equation. When we talk about the UN system, generally we focus our discussion on the states. And even though the private sector is at the general subject of international, what we call international law, we say that there's a gap there. Companies whose actions can have an impact on the multinational level which is the case, for example, in the environment and climate change and cyberspace in this case, which is a topic for today. The private sector does have a role to play, which is key in guaranteeing stability and allowing the other interested parties, stakeholders discuss the benefits of digital transformation in a safe manner. Now, respecting, protecting, remediating plans from the UN indicate that there is a duty of the state of protecting human rights, even by companies, which can be done through policies, regulations, different aspects that were commented on by Carrie Ann, especially in the OAS. And the states have agreed on these duties while signing different agreements on the international level for human rights. However, companies also have the duty to respect these. So the companies also have the obligation of guaranteeing and respecting 
these human rights guaranteeing and taking due diligence to avoid different fines and breaches which have and can have impacts on human rights. The third pillar of the remediation framework refers to the access to reparation mechanisms, and it determines that states must have and guarantee a right to access. And companies also have an important role to play because they can give reparations on these impacts. So in these over 10 years and the different situations and studies on this based these studies on the framework of protecting. Now, when we talk about digital transformation, emerging technologies, we're talking many times about technology companies on the global level, big techs. And the fact of the matter is that most of these companies do not have a complete access in Latin America. So it's very important in the international context, the same thing for the countries in the region that don't have full regulatory frameworks that guarantee rights in a correct manner and security in the correct manner. Private companies must take concrete measures to improve and guarantee human rights. And as we all know and have recognized, the rights that people have offline and online. This is the first point that I bring to the discussion. And as a region in Latin America, the Caribbean, we must discuss the quality of the products and digital services produced that if we see it at our market, they're produced in the global north. And we must discuss cybersecurity and how this impacts our human rights, at least our rights as consumers. The largest and greatest technologies are not usually developed in the global south. So how can companies also play a role and support in mitigating possible impacts by these technologies? This, I believe, is something that's important for Latin American countries to discuss together with the countries of the global north. But also, the large tech companies have to understand our cybersecurity market, how this market is in our region. So, Carrie Ann talked about a study on cybersecurity for 2020 carried out by the IDB and the OAS. I had a pleasure of working with them in this report. And one of the pillars and dimensions in this one is the fifth dimension in the study, which is on the standards, organization, and technologies. And what do we analyze? The use of technologies and cybersecurity, how we're using these standards for practices to reduce the risk in cybersecurity in our region, and how cybersecurity is in our market. So this is a data for 2020, but in either way, it's important to point out that we see that few countries have a level three in the level of one to five. Large economies are in level two and many are between levels one and two. So it's an important point of discussion, a duty that our region has to see which ones are left so that the market for cybersecurity can be developed further to guarantee digital products and strategies that are safe that allow us to trust in the digital environment. This impacts our rights as consumers and it can impact our human rights significantly. And the loss in trust in general is what we see as an impact now, Bruce, thank you very much. And I'll give the floor now to the rest of the speakers. Thank you. Mm. <clears throat> thank you so much, Barbara. That, that was really good. I mean, uh, this, uh, you know, we're all feeling, I think, uh, overwhelmed in a certain way by the, the uh, uh, 
uh, onslaught, the tidal wave of technology coming into our daily lives and uh, governments and institutions, including civil society, are, are struggling to uh, keep up. So you've uh, raised uh, such important points because uh, we've now all economies are uh, critically dependent on on this technology. So we have to catch up uh, with uh, all the other practical aspects of uh, policy and uh, and uh, stability. So thank you for that uh, big picture there. Uh, and speaking of uh, the the uh, big picture and the uh, art of balancing uh, the various considerations, uh, it's my pleasure now to uh, give the floor over to Luis Fernando. Muchas gracias. Um, primero que nada. Thank you very much. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank you for the kind invitation for me. It's an honor and it's a pleasure to be with all of you. Mi intervención está... And my comment as part of civil society is to bringing to this discussion a series of considerations that a very important number of civil society organizations consider to be relevant in tackling issues that have to do with cybersecurity and cybercrime. Today, almost 130 organizations of civil society and experts, academics, professors from all over the world are going to deliver a letter of the states of the UN according to the first session of negotiations with the UN on cybercrime and other matters. And I invite everybody to read it in detail, but I brought in and will mention some of the key points in that letter that we believe is to be truly important. And we believe that civil society and all these stakeholders involved agree that cybercrime represents a threat to human rights and the states must take the necessary measures to prevent all the effects of this phenomenon. Nevertheless, the different organizations, in, including the UN, the General Assembly, among other organizations, have taken the initiatives to combat cyber crime are heard and include human rights violations against journalists. For example, in that sense, it's important to understand and to tackle the complexity of cybercrime, not from a simplistic point of view. For example, the police are good and the delinquents are bad. No, it's a, a much more complex situation. In that sense, I want to give you three concrete examples of concerns and to show possible solutions and considerations that must be taken on board. For example, as we mentioned previously, there's not even a uniform understanding of what a cybercrime is and we see that there's contacts just because they have an element of involving IT as the medium or that there's a element that's correlated with the behavior makes that a cyber crime. For example, there's been a proliferation of typology of imprecise and vague situations such as terrorism, which in many cases, this has been a catch-all to criminalize activists, dissidents, and journalists. So my second point is that even when we're talking about crimes that are tightly related to IT systems, such as unauthorized access, there's been documentation and reports and since the typology is imprecise and vague, these lead to the criminalization of IT investigators whose labor is fundamental for the protection and cybersecurity because these investigators identify vulnerabilities in IT systems. And many times these cyber crimes inhibit that participation from the technical side of cybersecurity, inhibiting and lowering 
trust lowering the level of security and in that way it affects democracy human rights and the economy it's very important that we detail the concept of cybercrime and that we have safeguards and precision such as the amount of damage performed or the amount of damage affected which will allow for a more detailed typology of possible crimes or the non-compliance of terms and conditions of the private sector in cyberspace this has also been exacerbated with these vague norms on cybercrime so finally if we talk about cooperation and access to multinational evidence we see that it's very important to fight against cybercrime and we mustn't leave out the human rights and the duties that states have some jurisdictions don't have the necessary safeguards that that evidence won't be used for illegal acts or for negative acts as has happened unfortunately recently that states that are, are in charge that have the faculty to investigate this are those precisely that have used these tools to spy on journalists human rights activists among others so any access to multinational evidence should be controlled and supervised that the states that receive that evidence have a robust institutional and legal framework to avoid the access undue access to that evidence and to be used to breach and violate human rights these are just some examples that we're concerned about from civil society especially in cybercrime and that as we said before there's many more this is a complex discussion that requires the participation of all the sectors and that's why first of all i'd like to thank everybody for my invitation for speaking in this type of forum and once again i reiterate i'd like to invite everybody to read the letter written by 130 professors and experts on the discussion of cybersecurity sent to the un which includes the participation of all these sectors including civil society including those such as ours which are not on the consultative status in the UN. So then, this is just a highlight of the importance and in seeing the implications of cybercrime, we could see it as a uh, human rights issues. We could put it in the center of it. And we could see that this is an opportunity, but it could also be a serious risk when we don't consider that within our considerations. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Luis Fernando. Uh, it would be great if you if there is a link uh, for the letter, uh, you're welcome to post it in the uh, in the chat. That would be great. And we'll also make it available to the participants because uh, it sounds like an important uh, statement and in, uh, in the context of the conversations that are beginning, hopefully next week uh, in New York. Um, the uh, I wanted to uh, sort of come off of one of your particular um, uh points uh regarding the uh the uh, question of evidence um because uh you know certainly uh in my uh experience having worked at uh, u.s department of homeland security one of the key uh issues uh is uh is the problem that there's that uh crime some things are crimes in some countries and i'm not talking about cyber crimes but just crimes uh, that might be investigated uh, and uh, in other countries they are not and so uh, the formal uh, judicial and uh, police channels in the US it's through the uh, FBI um, don't operate effectively because uh, in the US for example uh, some kinds of speech are not considered uh, to be criminal whereas in some countries uh, particularly in South Asia they they are and so you end up with the uh, companies, you, as you point out, the, the large uh, platform companies having a kind of a, a 
extrajudicial role making decisions based on their terms and conditions about what is and is not appropriate speech. Uh, and so this gets uh, into a very difficult uh, area in particular with the, uh, the companies don't like being in that position. Uh, and, um, you know, it, it complicates the uh, ability of law enforcement to, to deal with uh, activities that could be creating, uh, you know, civil, uh, you know, unrest and riots and things like that, you know, insightful speech that uh, with different international standards. So uh, I just wanted to highlight your point about the, the uh, fact that, that there are different uh, cultural and legal standards, even, even among democracies. Uh, and that um, this complicates the uh, the area and makes us um, you know creates this interesting uh, problem around uh, kind of how people look at uh, digital transformation uh, because we are all dependent on the platform companies in a way to make that happen whether they're social media companies or search companies or or technology companies so I uh, with that kind of introduction maybe we could do kind of a round of uh, responses uh, from our panelists uh, uh, on that kind of topic and on other things that you've been hearing uh, here. So uh, who would like to go first uh, among you? Um, Bruce, I could jump in if you want. Great, Carrie Ann, why don't you start? Um, I think one of the things um, based along the lines that you were saying in terms of some of the challenges um, doing this would have, I think what is key and from the government, I mean, we're a regional governmental body. So if you think about one of the key challenges of developing legislation is someone within government has to do it. Um, and to have appropriate legislative frameworks to fight against cybercrime, as you've described it, um, there is a general lack of awareness at all levels, especially the decision-making one on what are the nuances needed to be included in cybercrime legislation. Cybersecurity by itself is like a whole new area for many policymakers and legislators. And many of them may be generally well informed about how these instruments work for international cooperation, whether it be for just general mutual legal assistance, but how the internet and the impact um, cyber threats have on their domestic cyber space, much less how to cooperate on the international plane on this. Um, I think that's one of the key things you have to kind of think about. Um, knowledge on the measures, the nuances within cybercrime. Um, as I started off my first intervention, the terminology is related to this, commonality in terminologies that if this is a um, act against a computer, for example, um, illegal access to a computer in one country, the definition in order to do any kind of mutual legal assistance for the evidence has to be the same in another country. So I think adopting adequate legal frameworks is a start, but improving the knowledge of those decision makers and legislators is something that needs to be discussed. I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah, it's, uh, it's one of the great challenges of all of us who work in the field to keep, uh, keep the generalists uh, uh, up to date and bring them up to speed. Uh, Claudio Pigaro, you have any views on what you've been hearing? Um, yes, I was. I just wanted to complement what Karian uh, just said. With our experience in the Dominican Republic, uh, it's, it's really quite challenging. Um, it took us three years after having a draft bill uh, for a cybercrime legislation. It took us three years to to be able to get it approved by by Congress. Uh, and you know, we had to to work a lot. Um, you know, the, the organized uh, workshops uh, with uh, legislators and and so on. Uh, to, you know, to get them to understand the issue. Um, it took us five years almost um, to ratify the Budapest Convention. Um, again, probably in part for the same reason and, and in part because we had a, a change in our constitution uh, in 2010 uh, that um, inverted the process of um, you know, um, international um, instruments um, uh, conventions. And still today, we've been working uh, with uh, Congress also in uh, both a cybersecurity uh, bill uh, and well, also also in um, data protection uh, legislation as well. Uh, it's it's in discussion in, in Congress right now, uh, and we are um, amending. We proposed just an amendment for our cybercrime uh, legislation 
uh, and that's gonna be starting next month. Uh, it's gonna be starting discussion in Congress. So you know, it's it's, it's a continuous uh, issue. Uh, we found very useful <clears throat> to, um, among other things, have uh, legislators meet their peers uh, in other countries that have previous experience on that. Uh, uh, in fact, some of our legislators have uh, joined others uh, in, in some international fora to uh, give them their perspective and their experience. I think that's always useful. It's always uh, also useful for in, in the judicial area with uh, judges as well. Uh, it's always useful uh, for them to hear peers um, uh, talking about these uh, issues. Uh, so, you know, that's something to take into consideration for those uh, countries that are in their processes of either drafting legislation or amending their legislation. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. Uh, we have an interesting uh, question that has come up in the uh, in the uh, chat in the Q and A. It says uh, all cooperation is based on trust. How can we make states trust each other? I don't think you can make anybody do anything when it comes to states. But uh, you know, uh, how how do we uh, how do we? It's it kind of gets to the practical aspect of uh, digital cooperation and a, a question about whether nationalism. Uh, is overshadowing multilateralism these days. And I think we've, uh, I certainly uh, believe that uh, we've missed an opportunity in the context of, uh, of the uh, pandemic. Uh, it has not been the best example of uh, international cooperation. And it's so maybe we can do better in cyberspace. Cyber often seems to be the uh, uh, pioneer, both in the good and the bad uh, aspects of human society. So maybe we can do some good uh, Barbara, what are you what are you thinking about right now? Gracias, Bruce. Uh, Thank you, Bruce. I would like to cover one point about the lack of clarity about the concept of uh, cybercrime that uh, Luis mentioned as well. Luis Fernando mentioned that before. Kerry and Claudio uh, have mentioned this about this definition of cybercrime in the national context, the importance for a legislation. And I would like to add how difficult it is to create this legislation in the international context. And when we hear the discussions, when we see all the all the studies that took to this, that led us to this committee. So in Latin America, we have seen very some points that in which all the Latin American countries are in the same situation. It's a it's very difficult to have access to the evidence, digital evidence, electronic evidence. So when talking to other colleagues about the uh, enactment of law, uh, I would like to use the word cyber crime because everything uses uh, digital evidence because what they wanted to do was to understand better how to manage this digital evidence and also the lack of uh, capacities that we mentioned before. But what is interesting, and I think Luis uh, touched on this, when you, you listen to the discussion in of the countries in the United Nations, especially the, the discussion of the region, we can see that the region, we, we, it's not that we all agree on the same topics, but the region has a group that is more aligned with another uh, with one part, another group that is more aligned with another part, other group that wants to be more uh, neutral in this discussion. And this raises a concern because when you see what the countries present, uh, it's everything, everything is cyber crime, as we Fernando mentioned. So that's the problem in the use of the child pornography, about uh, cyber terrorism, uh, misinformation campaigns, uh, cyber attacks, common uh, crime, we find everything or many things. So the question is, what are the techniques? When we talk about all these things that are cyber crime, that is part of the cyber crime, this raises a concern. And I understand there is a technical need that Claudio mentioned that countries should get an agreement, but the definitions from the political level are very diverse. And what happens every day is that these 
we have a diversity of topics here when we talk about uh, cyber crimes and there is a concern because um, when we talk about a nuclear bomb for killing cockroaches. So this is something different. We are talking about different things here. So that's one of the points that I was just um, thinking about. And also you mentioned these technological companies or IT companies that are doing this extra, playing this extra role from the um, legal point, and it's the definition of contents. I wanted to separate uh, topics. Uh, some things are more related to uh, security. For example, if companies can adopt practices that will guarantee a better protection of the data of people. They don't need to collect a lot of data. That's something that is going on in the region. They can collect this data. And if we are missing a legislation, so these companies are doing this, that's something where we could work, where we could uh, protect the consumers. And But in terms of how to use or how to uh, create these contents in the information campaigns. I think this is an important issue or topic. And also companies, just like in the United States, with all the efforts they are making, they had problems that are serious problems there in terms of misinformation. But what but the ones that are related to or what they spend in terms of efforts in the north or in the south and the mistakes that they have when we are talking about the um, content. So there is a large difference between the north and the south. So the different actors or stakeholders should also consider that we need an effort to consider the human rights in the region. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, you know, you raise uh, again the problems uh, or complexities of having uh, you know the uh, the large companies involved. Uh, and uh, we have a question in the um, in the Q and A that's interesting that uh, asks about uh, something that you mentioned, Luis Fernando. Uh, the uh, question of white hack white hat hackers uh, who are who are basically, uh, you call them as you did correctly, uh, you know, cyber investigators. And uh, certainly we face that problem in the US where some laws uh, could uh, inadvertently, you know, criminalize uh, those kinds of activities. But on the other hand, uh, it's a difficult uh, to get that balance right because, uh, you know, who is a legitimate investigator and who, who, is, uh, who is not. So uh, always uh, one of these complex challenges of these overlapping Things and I wonder, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're, we have about two minutes left here before I turn it over to Danielle. But um, you know, what's your, what is uh, your sense, uh, Luis Fernando, and also uh, Claudio, uh, regarding the, um, you know, how are the uh, big platform companies going to play uh, in these conversations uh, going forward in terms of uh, balancing all the different interests? Uh, Luis Fernando, go ahead, Claudio. Um, I just wanted to mention uh, about the the part of the these white hat hackers. The, the thing about that is that uh, we need to be able to establish very clearly uh, which uh, which are which, you know, because anyone can cover um, on on that. And I was just, you know, I was just making sure you were okay. I was just exploring to help you out, but I did not ask you for your help. So. Uh, we have to be uh, very careful and in our legislation establishes that whoever does that without previous authorization then is in, in breach of that uh, legislation. So, you know, uh, that, that's something that, that needs to be very clear because uh, otherwise uh, we'll have uh, a mess. And about the, the companies, um, I think, and, the, and, and about that, that question that, that Barbara answered um, previously, um, not only states have to trust each other, but also these uh, major global providers need to trust states as well. Uh, and, and if you look at the reports that uh, all of those companies make about um, the requests from states that they uh, reply to, 
and you see the number of requests versus the number of, of replies that they do, you see that it varies a lot from state to state. So they, you know, in, in, in a few words, they trust some states more than others um, because of how those states uh, behave, uh, you know, how they act, how they respect human rights and, and so on. Uh, so I think there's, there's a lot uh, to be done. Uh, we have been discussing in the um, TCY committee for the Budapest Convention um, on, on trying to develop an online tool that uh, will at least give other states and providers the information on who are the authorized people to uh, request information, uh, what are the legislations of, uh, of all the states that, uh, because maybe in, in some states, a police officer can subpoena for information. In others, it has to be uh, a prosecutor. In others, it needs to be a judge. And, and we need to uh, be able to have a one-stop shop uh, where we can uh, look at all that so that the companies can evaluate. They spend a lot of time evaluating the requests, evaluating the legality of the requests. Uh, so I think that that's one area in, in which we need to work on. Yeah, no, that's, that's such a practical point because, uh, you know, the request comes in and it's not uh, legally uh, viewed as legally okay. And then you lose another three months and the evidence is disappearing, you know, so mm -hmm. this is a big problem. That's a, that'll be a very practical uh, guide and assistance. Well, uh, Luis Fernando, you get the last word here before I turn over to Danielle. So no pressure. Muchas gracias. And Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Well, well, just, just a few brief comments on the topic related to the security researchers and investigators, that's a problem. We can't just consider that the non-authorization by a company, for example, constitutes enough to criminalize a security investigator because sometimes it's the software and technology manufacturers interested in that the vulnerability isn't known. And a way that we can assure a true and robust cybersecurity is to have inclusive investigations, even though the manufacturers would prefer not to have this. That's why the unauthorized access penalties shouldn't just take in account and consideration the unauthorized access, but also other intentions such as malicious intent and damage caused and not just a quote unquote reputational damage that even though they show them a vulnerability, they do nothing about it. We must also talk about the evidence and very briefly, because there's a problem with evidence in that states, there's no robust requirements to access electronic evidence. So there's, for example, a treaty that should homologate upwards these standards to make them more astringent according to multinational evidence and not create a race downwards, so to say, in lesser levels of security to be able to access evidence in a way that they can't even access evidence in their own countries. So yes. There's a Russian proverb that I'm sure a lot of people know, trust but verify. In that sense, the norms on cyber crimes and international cooperation for the use of evidence must consider verifiable trust and not have a betrayal of trust in judicial aspects. And also I've seen many people in the chat to ask asking for the link to the letter. It's not been published yet, but if you allow me, you can please send me your emails and I can distribute these to the participants that send me their email and we could benefit everybody that way. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Luis Fernando. Why don't you post your email in the chat so that people can send you directly and not, uh, and not have to uh, send everybody their emails. Uh, but that sounds great. And if you send it to us, we will also send it to the, uh, to the participants in general uh, as part of the meeting follow-up. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, dear panelists, for your uh, in insights and this conversation. Uh, Danielle, uh, what are your thoughts having uh, heard about all this? Thank you so much.
Muchas gracias, Bruce. Muchas gracias a todos. Thank you very much, Bruce. Thank you very, very much, everybody. Thank you very much, ambassadors, for your kind words, Ambassador Navarrete, Ambassador Durasma. We wanted to have a very open conversation on cybersecurity, such as how these states must approach this, and also civil society and academia, because at the end of the day, this is about finding certain common threads in the different presentations that we saw today. And it's clear that this isn't a one dimensional problem. It's clear that the challenge must include not just the states, but the multiple stakeholders. And I believe that the debates we've had on the international level show the relevance of holding them as such. And here I value the ambassador's words, ambassadors Navarrete and Karasma, recognize the importance that these are inclusive processes. And here I will dovetail out of other people's words that in inclusive processes, they're only seen as a north-north relation. However, south-south relations, south-north relations have many particularities and challenges that make this discussion acquire certain nuances. And please allow me to give you an example with respect to this conversation. In Latin America and the Caribbean as a region, there's 14 countries that have a cybersecurity policy and strategy since 2010 onwards. And thanks to the OAS, this labor has been able to be maintained and there are more countries that have this. However, what's missing in this process of discussion, be it policies and the discussion in the international organizations is that the countries should make their position transparent in one of the issues under debate. What's their position on the application of international law to cyberspace activities? And here, and why do I bring this to discussion? Because when you realize and you check the policies, you can see that there's a declaration that is coherent with the consensus in the expert group of cybersecurity in the UN. But if you don't in go into the content of the policy, there's been very little appropriation in making them transparent and making them known. So we need this link between the findings of the expert group and the way the countries design their policies, their strategies, and design their regulatory framework. And on this point, I want to come back once again in a few more minutes. But also we have to recognize that if the labor of governmental experts has been hugely useful, it has two limits. It has a political limit and it has a technical limit. The political limit because it's always under the governments, all the richness of conversation that exists on ideal necessary measures to protect and elevate cybersecurity standards in our countries lacks the vision of civil society, academia, and even companies. So in this sense, the work performed by the open-ended working group without a doubt constitutes a ad substantial advancement so that this process can be more democratic, inclusive, and transparent. In this sense, we truly value the efforts made by the UN with the open-ended working group to open up the discussion. And I've had the pleasure of working and participating in one of some of these sessions before we were confined to our homes during the pandemic. And the debate, I believe, is one of the most rich debates in international matters on cybersecurity. And this impacts the region directly, because if you see what organizations are participating in the region that weren't governments, it was very few. Even government representation wasn't especially highlighted. And I believe that countries should be able to solve this. Furthermore, today's debate highlights the point that even though we were called to talk about this, we did not talk much on the application of international law to cyberspace, which is a political debate. And that has many consequences on the various issues that were discussed, as was discussed by the ambassadors. The dimension of human rights is transversal and cross-cutting. So I believe, and this is my personal opinion, that even in some of the debates that were 
mentioned on cybercrime, we can consider a focus on human rights, thinking of the protection of self-determination of people thinking of the right to private property. We can consider that the responsible dissemination of security breaches is a way of guaranteeing effective protection of rights. And here, I agree with who went before me. If I have laws on cybercrime that fine or punish an ethical hacker due to unauthorized access, I have a huge problem because who can solve the problem is criminalized. And just to share our experience in Chile, we're in the last stage on the legislative debate. And one of the two points that's pending in the discussion is the inclusion for the first time at all on a national crime of cyber crime law is penal responsibility or criminal responsibility for cyber crime or ethical hacking. So there's those of us that promote this point of view that are convinced that if we're coherent with the discourse of the best protection of rights, protecting the work carried out by ethical hackers helps fulfill this objective. And with this, just to not use all the time, I just wanted to highlight two additional things that were mentioned by Barbara and Carrie Ann. Maturity. We have spent a lot of resources in trying to measure the maturity of countries and cybersecurity, but in my opinion, we still have not spent enough money and resources and time in measuring how the technical maturity is in countries, not just the states, but organizations, academia, and people. We focused too much on the political dimension and in some cases excessively on cybercrime and very little on the human dimension. And at the end of the day, when we talk about cybersecurity in cyberspace, when we talk about security in cyberspace, what we're doing is we're trying to build an open, free, resilient, and safe space so that people can have their life in an environment where they can feel free to use their talents, where they can trust, and that the use of their abilities is in a space where threats and dangers are as few as possible. And I believe that this is something that we can advance in, in the session, together with other countries where we can have some comparative advantages due to our homogeneousness in our territory, our languages, because the position that we share is shared in multiple aspects in uh, society. So I thank everybody for their invitation to participate. And I believe it's a good arena to continue. What's more, we hope that even greater amount of countries and people even are part of this conversation. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Danielle, and thank you to our uh, panelists and to Ambassador Navarrete and Ambassador Yarsma for joining us today. Uh, thanks also to our translators, Patricio Gonzalez and his team uh, for doing a great job. And uh, we will be sending uh, all of you the uh, a link to the uh, recording of this uh, session and also information about the various documents which uh, have been discussed today. So, uh, and we'll keep you posted vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, future events uh, in this series of uh, conversations. So uh, th again, thank you everyone for uh, participating and joining, and we look forward to seeing you in person, uh, we hope, uh, in the next uh, months ahead. Thank you so much.